These were the final words that were captured on the cockpit voice recording on board Lot Polish Airlines Flight 5055. Translated from Polish into English, it reads, Good night. Goodbye. Bye. We are dying. These haunting final words came at the very end of a struggle to save the lives of 183 people. The case of Flight 5055 is one where a lot of things went wrong. On May 9th, 1987, this large passenger plane fell out of the sky following a devastating, catastrophic failure within the plane's engines. What followed was a desperate struggle from the pilots to save the plane from crashing. Ultimately, this resulted in the deadliest air disaster in Poland's history. But it's how it got to this point is what we need to examine further. Because hidden away beneath the surface of the plane's skin is a certain type of failure that occurred at multiple levels, mechanical and financial. The date was the 9th of May, 1987. At Warsaw, in Poland, a large passenger plane was preparing for a long flight to the United States that morning. It was a Saturday, and it was a warm, sunny, clear day. The perfect day to go flying. Lot Flight 5055 was the chartered flight from Warsaw to San Francisco via New York. A total of 172 passengers would be taking the flight that day. Lot Polish Airlines in the 1970s had launched their first transatlantic flights connecting Poland with the United States. At that time, during the Cold War and under the Soviet sphere of influence, Lot didn't have much choice in sourcing a long-range airliner, and the plane they ended up with was the Aleutian IL-62. When the IL-62 first took to the skies in the early 1960s, it was actually, for a time, the largest passenger plane around. It has four rear-mounted engines, giving it a rather distinctive look. For air carriers in Eastern Europe and beyond, the IL-62 was the answer for long-range operations. It's also a plane that Lot has had some history with. In 1980, Flight 007, one of their IL-62s, crashed nearby to the airport here in Warsaw, killing 87 people. Following an investigation into that accident, revealing the cause to be linked to manufacturing and design defects in the aircraft's engines, the airline sought to modernize the IL-62 fleet by replacing them with the newer IL-62M. The updated version of the plane that first started flying in 1974 featured a number of improvements to the aircraft, including a redesigned flight deck. Modifications to the wings were also made, introducing a newer spoiler system and increased fuel capacity. Above all, the biggest change to this plane was different engines. The Soloviev D-30 engines would find their way onto a number of the most popular planes to ever come out of the Soviet Union, including the massive Aleutian IL-76 and the ever-popular Tupolev 154. The engines being the source of the disaster in the 1980 incident, Lot replaced all of their older IL-62s with these newer models. The story and the specific details about the disaster of Lot Flight 007 is best saved for another day. Redirecting our attention back to Warsaw in 1987, this particular aircraft was built in 1983, and so it was a fairly new plane at the time. Taking command of the large plane that day was 59-year-old Captain Zygmunt Pavlajek. That day was supposed to be a day off for the captain, but he stepped in to cover for another pilot. He was exceptionally experienced with nearly 20,000 flight hours to his name. He had spent over 10 years in the cockpit of the IL-62 by the time of the accident. Sat in the right seat was the much younger 44-year-old first officer, Leopold Karcher. Now, these old Soviet airliners typically required up to five people to fly. In this case, there were six men in the cockpit. Also on the flight deck was a flight engineer, 43-year-old Wojciech Kwasik. 47-year-old Leszław Wachowski was sat in the navigator's position. Handling the radios was 43-year-old Leszek Bogdan. And finally, the last member of crew was in an observation role, 53-year-old Richard Chimaleski. With a total of 11 crew members on board, the flight's total occupants was brought to 183. Now, with setting up the scene here when looking into this disaster, 
the conversation certainly can't miss the extraordinary stroke of luck that was given to one passenger who was supposed to be on the flight. One Janina Szulsz Tomaszewska was a New Jersey resident and was traveling home after visiting family in Poland. During her trip, she purchased an expensive mink coat. As she was traveling home in Warsaw Airport, she didn't know that she needed to declare the item. Now, flight 5055 was a sold-out flight. Every seat was booked. But there was an additional overbooked passenger, let's just say, who happened to be acquainted with a customs officer in Warsaw Airport. This customs officer basically decided to do this individual a solid and free up a seat for them. Janina Szulsz Tomaszewska was singled out by the customs officer as she didn't declare this expensive fare. She missed the flight because of it. Though she argued with airport personnel in Warsaw, she didn't know it at the time, but her failure to file the appropriate documents and declare her item had just saved her life. At 10.07 in the morning on May 9, 1987, Flight 5055 pushed back from the gate in Warsaw. The airport layout in Warsaw has not changed much since 1987. Flight 5055 was taxied down to the south side of the airport for a northerly departure from runway 33. Now this is a case where we actually have an air traffic control recording to work with. What you are about to hear are the actual words that were exchanged between the plane and the control tower that morning. Using this recording, we can gain a further understanding as to how the following events unfolded. After takeoff, the pilots were given a heading from the departure controller, heading 290. Additionally, the controller cleared the flight to climb up to 28,000 feet, flight level 280. As the plane climbed, there was some conflict of airspace between the plane and nearby military airspace. When Flight 5055 first accepted the departure clearances on the ground, among the conditions in the clearance was to reach 18,000 feet before reaching a certain waypoint as the plane flew out northwest of Warsaw. It turned out in this case that they were below this threshold, which may have posed a risk of a mid-air collision, as training exercises were being conducted that day and military and civilian radio communications were segregated. The following exchange was recorded. As a result of this exchange, the pilots sought to climb faster and thus increase the throttles to maximum power. The throttles would stay at this higher setting for around 9 minutes. Soon, the departure controller handed them off to another frequency and said goodbye. The recording here on the controller's end is extremely muffled. I have done my best here to raise the frequencies of this Polish controller's vocals. The new controller clears the flight to a higher altitude, up to 31,000 feet. Thank you. 
wchodzimy, co w zasadzie się wchodzimy. The time was 10.40. Lot Polish Airlines Flight 5055 was passing over the town of Grudziadz, about 110 miles northwest of Warsaw, about 50 miles south of Gdansk. They reported an altitude of 26,500 feet as they continued their further climb up to 31,000. In the cabin, the flight attendants were preparing their service for the passengers. Hanna Czesinska was one of the five flight attendants on the flight. She was positioned in the very rear of the plane, in that space between the two sets of engines. Disaster was about to strike the plane, just as passengers were settling into the long flight. The following segment of the ATC recording will give us a window into the moment catastrophe struck the plane. Let's play out this section of the recording before going into detail on what exactly happened here. Now that was the air traffic control recording. We also have the cockpit voice recording transcript from the moment the failure occurred. From the ATC recording in the CVR transcript, what we have learned is that, from the pilot's perspective, two of the plane's four engines, the two on the left side, had malfunctioned, failed. At that moment, the pilots really had no idea into the specifics. They knew, however, that there was an explosion, an explosive decompression, and a suspected fire. As you heard in the recording, the controller suspected a collision of some kind. The pilots weren't sure. Now this is the crux of the situation. The key question to answer, what happened to these engines? Well, more specifically, the source of the problem was actually just with one engine. What the pilots didn't know was that an uncontained engine failure had just occurred with the number two engine. That is, on the IL-62, the inner engine on the left side. Now, an uncontained engine failure could occur for any one of a multitude of reasons. The history of aviation is littered with such events. But to distinguish it from a contained engine failure, the uncontained scenario involves parts of the engine's internals being ejected outside of the engine housing. This is what happened on this flight. And it can't really be overstated just how catastrophic this failure was, for reasons we'll get into soon. But first, let's unpack the details of this specific case of an uncontained engine failure. In this case, the low pressure engine shaft inside engine number two had succumbed to excessive heat damage. This led to a total failure and disintegration of the shaft and the engine internals as a whole. The next question is how this heat was generated in the first place. For that, we need to understand what this thing is. This is a roller bearing. These are found in all types of engines. You can even find them in the engine of your car. They can also be found inside of airplane engines. The number of these bearings varies on the engine model. They are used to give support and bear loads which can minimize friction within an engine. The roller bearings on the Solovyev D30 engines are supposed to be fitted with a total of 26 of these cylindrical individual roller parts to make up the larger component. Now, we are only interested in one of the roller bearings the one that acted as a boundary between the high and low pressure engine shafts and turbines. What was later determined by investigators when looking through the wreckage of the plane was that this bearing, in addition to the others related to engine number two, 
were fitted with only half of the necessary rolling parts, 13 as opposed to the normal 26. A lot of Polish airlines knew about this, but allowed the engine to go into service as there was a delay on the shipment of newer bearings and they needed the engine. It was revealed in the years after the Iron Curtain fell that Lot was known to have employed cost-cutting practices in the operation of their planes, especially when it came to their engines. It's something that people have linked to this disaster in the years since. Furthermore, an additional modification in the form of multiple drilled holes into the critical bearing at fault was supposed to be a method to supply lubrication to the bearing. Instead, it acted as more of a point of weakness and fatigue. This enabled an environment where the engine shaft was experiencing temperatures in excess of 1,000 degrees Celsius. The component that should have helped support the shaft and reduce friction had deteriorated the engine shaft to such a poor condition that, on that fateful day, it broke. This was following the nine-minute period of maximum applied thrust demanded from the pilots to allow them to climb faster. This was how the uncontained engine failure occurred. At the onset of the failure, the pilots immediately experienced the human effects of decompression. Just when the pilots were settling in for their long flight, they suddenly received warnings indicating an engine fire. The number one and two engines were down. The explosive force of the failure had sent debris from the failed engine into the neighboring number one engine. As a result, the two left side engines were basically destroyed in this moment. Additionally, Vital hydraulic flight control lines were severed in the process. Other debris fractured the skin of the aircraft and teared a hole at the rear of the fuselage, depressurizing the cabin. Numerous electrical failures occurred across the plane, including the failure of the fire detection system in the lower cargo deck, where a fire began to burn. It was at that moment of failure that flight attendant Hanna Chesinska, positioned in the space between the engines, was killed. She was the first fatality. According to Polish sources, during the crisis that followed about four minutes before the crash, a flight attendant was reported to have went on record on the cockpit voice recording to say that they couldn't find her. Hannah, from that moment on, was missing. Her body was never found at the eventual crash site, which meant her fate could have been one of two possibilities. One, she was ejected from the plane following the decompression, or two, she was stuck in the back of the plane and burned in the fire or even possibly injured or killed directly from debris from the faulting engine. Either way, her remains were never recovered or were unrecognizable at the scene of disaster. Captain Pavlajek, with his 20,000 flight hours, now needed to put his knowledge and experience of flying to work. He began to turn the plane around for a return to Warsaw. After swiftly identifying the decompression, he began to descend to a lower altitude so himself, his crew and passengers could safely breathe. During the turn to the right, the captain discovered that this situation was worse than he thought, as if it couldn't get any worse. The flight controls were rather unresponsive. The rudder and elevators weren't working. They did have control of the ailerons and could steer the plane where it needed to go, and they did have some pitch control by use of trim, but this wasn't enough to effectively manipulate the pitch with such a heavy plane on just two engines. Flight 5055 would now continue to descend, against the pilot's will. Additionally, we should note that four minutes after the crisis began, the indicated engine fire was extinguished. The IL-62 was equipped with an automated fire extinguishing system, but there were still fires in other parts of the plane that would continue to burn and spread. The pilots were unaware of this, due to the electrical outage shutting off much of the fire detection systems. Let's continue with the recording. Thank you. 
They needed to jettison fuel to prevent an overweight landing. Also, the reason why the pilots elected Warsaw to be the return airport, as opposed to the nearer Gdansk, this was likely to give them a bit of time to actually jettison the fuel. But there was a problem. The electrical failures across the plane had left some connection issues between the cockpit and the electrically powered fuel dumping system. They couldn't dump the fuel right away. It took several minutes for the jettison system to actually begin the dump, and over 30 tons of fuel was released from the plane. 1051. The pilots were struggling to keep control of their aircraft. They were continuously losing altitude, and with minimal flight controls, a radio call goes out to try and get them into a nearer airport. Located northwest of Warsaw is Modlin Airport. At the time, this was a military airfield, but air travelers today will know this as the Warsaw Airport served by Ryanair. The controller would spend multiple minutes trying to contact Modlin for clearance. The situation on board the stricken plane would only continue to deteriorate. The pilots were unaware of the fire that was in the cargo hold. As mentioned earlier, an electrical failure had cut off the fire detection systems in the cargo bay. The fire continued to burn without interference. In the cabin, passengers were absolutely aware of how dire their situation was. Some passengers even took time to write notes of goodbye that would later be found in the wreckage. 1053. The pilots would again ask about the option of landing in Modlin. Eventually, the flight received clearance to land at the Modlin base and requested that controllers use their radar to guide them to the airport. However, the plane had descended beyond a point where it could be picked up on the radar of the higher altitude controllers. With radar contact lost, the crew were sent radio information to try and locate the Modlin airfield. They were once again put back in touch with Warsaw Approach, where they made contact at 10.58. With each passing minute, the captain evidently had doubts about the idea of landing here. Though it was a closer airport, the emergency services were better equipped at Warsaw. At 11 o'clock, the pilots made the call to fly directly to Warsaw's main airport. The controller offers the pilots an approach onto runway 11, which would mean they could fly almost directly into the airport from their heading, approaching Warsaw from the northwest, regardless of the wind conditions. This would decrease the flying time and get them on the ground sooner. Captain Pavlajic did have some doubts about this and requested wind information. Upon hearing that the straight-in approach would include a 22 km per hour tailwind, he elected to fly the runaway 33 approach from the south instead, using the same runway they used to take off. The crew were rather adamant about that with controllers. <laughs> Eleven o eight. Flight five zero five five was roughly fifteen kilometers from the airport. They were being directed south of Warsaw. The plan was to bring the plane in with a left turn to line up for the runway. 
It is here that we reach the end game of the crisis. The fire that had continued to burn throughout the plane was now indicated to the pilots as it had spread to the right side engines. It was burning and eating its way through the remaining flight control systems. They would communicate that they were now having difficulty with turning the plane. In the final minute of the flight, as they tried to wrestle the plane toward the airport, they drift off course. Visible from the ground, many looked up into the clear sky to observe the crippled plane in its final moments. In the final seconds of the flight, Flight 5055 would transmit its final message. The transmission gives us a small glimpse into the chaos that had now descended upon the cockpit. They transmit their final words as all control was now lost. The final descent toward the ground brought the illusion jet into the Kabata woods just a few kilometers from the airport. Out of control, in a nose-down attitude, Lot Polish Airlines Flight 5055 crashed into the woods. All 183 people on board the plane were now dead. Had the flight crew had just one to two more minutes, they might have made it. Very quickly following the crash, first responders had arrived only to witness the horrifying scene of plane wreckage. The crash had carved a path through the forest, some even noticing the human remains tangled into the trees. Some sources have speculated on the thought process of the captain in the final seconds before the crash. In this desperate, dire situation, it may have become apparent that there was no way with such little control that they could have guided the plane to safety. Even in 1987, there were populated areas surrounding the Kabata woods. Beyond the end of the trees from where the plane was heading lies the densely populated neighborhood of the same name. The Kabata suburb around this time was experiencing large population growth as people moved into newly constructed apartment blocks. It is the belief of some that Captain Pavlajic, using what little flight controls he had left, crashed the plane into the woods on purpose to prevent further loss to human life. The investigation that followed had to be conducted without much help from the aircraft's manufacturer in the Soviet Union. Ilyushin only supplied the most basic of information, and their cooperation in the investigation was limited. Polish investigators established that this accident bore a striking resemblance to the aforementioned disaster of Flight 007, which occurred seven years previously. Both disasters were the result of an uncontained engine failure. An even earlier similar incident, the Koenigs Wusterhausen disaster of 1972, was a case of an in-flight fire, albeit for different reasons, that destroyed the flight controls leading to the deaths of 156 people. For more information, consider watching our video on that disaster. 
These types of uncontained engine failures are devastating, and airplane manufacturers over the years have taken great steps in preventing these types of accidents. United Airlines Flight 232 is another case that had many similarities to that of Lot 5055. Polish investigators forwarded their findings to Moscow with a number of recommendations, including the addition of an engine vibration gauge on the IL-62, something that was actually raised when the first crash occurred. The modernizing of the plane's fire and smoke detection equipment was also recommended. At that time, Lot was unable to purchase planes from Western manufacturers such as Boeing and Airbus. Behind the Iron Curtain, their options were limited to Soviet planes. This changed at the end of the 1980s, and the airline eventually retired to the IL-62 in 1992. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching. You made it! You have made it to the end of what has been, to this day, the longest ever episode of Disaster Breakdown. Mind you, that is only by a matter of seconds, as I think the Aerolingus video is only just a little bit shorter. I do love making these longer videos, and everyone seems to love them too. Unfortunately, I can't make them every week, as that is borderline impossible for a weekly schedule and just one person, me. However, I have thought of perhaps changing the upload schedule so I can do these longer videos on the regular, but only upload as and when they're completed, which would be longer than seven days. It's something I'm thinking about, so we'll wait and see what happens. Anyway, I would love to take a moment here to thank my amazing patrons over on Patreon for their generosities towards the channel. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now, so if you do see your name here, big thanks, big thanks to you. Shoutouts this week go to Ali.nr and It's Giants, who actually pledged at the highest tier this week. Honestly, what a legend. Thank you so very much. If you yourself would like to support the channel further, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new content, two days before they go out publicly on YouTube. So that is it from me this week, I am going to shut up now. But if you do want to continue hearing my voice, you can always check out a couple of the videos that should be on the screen right now. That being said, thanks for watching, and I will see you next week. Goodbye!